you should put your money into 60% stocks and 40% bonds. A classic diversified portfolio. A cla- That's right. Very well said, Zach. A classic diversified balanced portfolio. By the way, if you have that portfolio, that is not a very good portfolio for retirement. <laughs> You're about to find out why. Welcome to Retirement Today. I'm your co-host, Zach Holcomb, and alongside me, we have Michael Reese. He's a certified financial planning professional, and he spent the last 20 plus years specializing in the world of retirement planning, helping families get into and through retirement. We're back here on Retirement Today. I think we got a great show on our hands today. I know our listeners are pretty pumped. Um, You know, you told me before the show, we wanted to talk a little bit about kind of who we are, what we do, who we serve, and how that's important to our listeners. What do we do? So as you're listening in the car, you know, you probably think financial advisors, they're all the same, right? They dress the same. They talk the same. They look the same. It's like they're these little robots, you know, that are printed out in some financial advisor factory, Mm -hmm. right? They're 3D printed. They're all, (laughs) that's right. My son has a 3D printer now, by the way. It's really cool. cool. Yeah. Anyway, what we do is we really focus on retirement planning and we do comprehensive planning for retirement. And, you know, you like to say it all the time, Zach. What's your favorite line? An investment plan? That's not a retirement plan. That's exactly it. Investing is certainly part of retirement planning, but it is just that, a part of retirement planning. Yeah, just one piece of the puzzle. Yeah, so when you ask, hey, Mike, what do you guys do? We do comprehensive retirement planning. Well, what does that mean? That means we help our clients with their money issues, which is investing is part of it, but also income planning. You know, by the way, It could be said that income planning is retirement planning, you know, and and one of the things that I think is missed way too often is, you know, when we talk to people, they don't have an income plan. And, you know, as you're listening, think about that. Do you have an income plan? Well, if you don't have an income plan, one that takes into account your Social Security, pensions, you know, maybe rental income, you know, when are you going to take money from your portfolio, your retirement accounts or your after-tax money? And is your money generating enough income, you know, to make sure that you're you're plugging your income gaps? If you don't have an income plan that's really easy to understand, guess what? You don't have a retirement plan. It's that simple. So that's money questions. We help them with their tax planning. And, you know, everybody wants to pay less tax if they can legally, right? Sure. Well, except for like three people listening to us right now. Never met one of those three people. Yeah, well, I've met them. I just... <laughs> I don't think I can help them. (laughs) Anyway, and then you've got risk management. You know, and and what is risk management? Well, what happens if the market either collapses or goes sideways for a period of time? Are you still going to be okay? What about uh, risk of health care? You die too soon or you get sick along the way. What if inflation goes crazy? Right now, inflation is going crazy. Well, not really crazy compared to other countries, but to us, it's going crazy. If that's temporary, great. But what if it's not? What if it's more long term? Those are risks. So your money, your taxes, your risk management, you need to have all of those areas covered to have a well-coordinated retirement plan. So what do we do? We do comprehensive retirement planning that handles all of that stuff, right? And then the next question I always like to uh, talk about is, you know, who do we serve, right? Because I think sometimes people think, oh, you're a financial firm. You only want to talk to people that have like lots of money. Right. And and lots of money being defined as, I don't know, $5 million or more or yeah, something. Millions, right? Yeah, millions. Yeah, millions. Or what What is what do they say in Austin Powers? One billion dollars. Yeah, it was, remember it was like yeah. one million yeah. dollars. Yeah. And like uh, 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 <laughs> Dr. Evil. <laughs> I think you want to bump that up a little yeah. bit. Anyway, the point is we serve primarily middle class and upper middle class families like that's who we serve and so typically the clients we serve they might have anywhere from say 250,000 that they're working with all the way up to maybe 5 million Um, you start getting below 250 there's not a lot we can do you start getting over 5 million things start getting a little more complicated our sweet spot is really that range of assets it's middle class and upper middle class families right that's who we serve and the reason that we do it and i'm going to share some stories on the show today but here's why we serve that group of people 
I am a I have learned over 25 plus years in this industry that and I see it over and over again the same things happening over and over the financial industry as a whole does a really really bad job servicing these people I mean like a really bad job all they want to do is talk about investing money all they want to really talk about is growth and accumulation and I see the exact same mistakes happening over and over and over. Right, because they're doing the exact same things for all of these people. Yeah, here's a great example, by the way. I want you to think about my parents. Okay. When my, my mom and dad retired back in 1999, and at the time they had some pension and Social Security, but my parents had $300,000 saved for retirement. It's all Now, my dad, middle-class guy, worked for State Farm, claims adjuster, great values. They raised four children, put us all through college. And when they retired, they had about, he had about 300,000 in his 401k. But guess what? That was plenty because what did he need for income? About a thousand a month, 12,000 a year, 4%, right? So what does the big financial industry tell him to do? Say, oh, we've got this solved. We know exactly what you should do. You should put your money into 60% stocks and 40% bonds. A classic diversified portfolio. A cla That's right. Very well said, Zach. A classic diversified balanced portfolio. By the way, if you have that portfolio, that is not a very good portfolio for retirement. <laughs> You're about to find out why. So they, so they do it. They're like, okay, 60-40, that's what we will do. And the first year in retirement is 1999. The market's up like... 20% or something, everything's working great. And it's like, oh, this is awesome. Retirement's lovely. We took our 12,000 out. Our accounts grew. Retirement is easy peasy. Mm -hmm. But then the dot-com crash happened and we had 2000, 2001, 2002. In that three-year period, the stock market was down roughly 50%. My parents, who started with 300,000, remember, they're only taking out 12,000 a year. By the time they hit the end of 2002, basically four years into retirement, their accounts were down below 150 grand. They lost over half of what it took their entire lives to save. I mean, think about that. It took my dad 30 plus years to save that 300,000. And in four short years, half of it was gone. And at that point, you know, what do they have to do? They have to start taking less income. In fact, they stopped taking it all together, right? Because they're worried they're going to run out of money, which if they kept taking $1,000 a month, they would have run out of money. But they're like, holy cow, we got to tighten our belt. My dad's thinking, man, do I have to go back to work? Like, they sleepless nights, money, stress about money. They were freaking out. And guess what? They and everybody else. See, here's the problem. A balanced portfolio of 60% stocks and 40% bonds that's a great portfolio to grow and accumulate without too much volatility. But if you're trying to live off of it in retirement, it is dead in the water. It only works when markets are good, not when markets are bad. And guess what, folks? That just ain't good enough, as my dad would say. I'll tell you, this is a great example of things that are done really well, but then how little mistakes can cost you everything. We see that a lot in retirement. Yeah, and by the way, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, hey, I'm worried about my retirement, and you know, maybe you're within that retirement red zone. Do you know what the retirement red zone is, Zach? You know, it's like you're, you're close, but you're not there yet, like maybe five, five or so years out. Yeah, the way the retirement red zone, as I've seen it um, defined, is the five years, it's a 10-year period. Okay. Five years before you retire and five years after you retire. Gotcha. Because this period of your life represents some of the most sensitive uh, decision-making time period. Meaning, like, little mistakes here are magnified. Uh, big mistakes are, of course, just killing you. Um, but it's a time of life where you absolutely have to get your eyes dotted and T's crossed. If you do things right in this time period, everything's going to flow for you. I want to share the story. This is really the story of Wes. So when I was a kid, my grandfather, Wes, he was like larger than life. 
you know, he's already a big guy. I want to say he's like 6'2 or 6'3. You know, pretty, not like a bodybuilder, but, you know, pretty in good shape. Yeah. Right? And he had one of these personalities, Zach. He would just laugh and laugh. I mean, just really a big, happy personality. Controls the room the second he steps in. Oh, yeah. He's one of those guys. And I remember when we would go visit him, you know, grandma and grandpa. I remember one weekend we were there. I must have been, I wasn't very old. I was maybe eight years old, right? And he had the weekend edition of the Wall Street Journal. Ooh, exciting. And he was showing me. I'm like, what are you looking at, grandpa? He's showing me. You know, he was a stock investor. So what my grandfather would do, this is the, before 401ks and all this other stuff, right? Mm-hmm. What he would do is he would save up some money and then he would buy stock. He'd go to a stockbroker and buy some stock. And then he'd save up more money and buy some more stock and save up more money and buy some more stock and so on and so on. And so the reason he was doing this was that it was his goal when he retired. They lived Now, my grandparents lived in you know, Lansing, Michigan, which is kind of the south part of Michigan. When they retired, he wanted to buy a cottage on a lake in northern Michigan. He wanted this cottage to be like a family enclave. You know, the kind of place where all the children and grandchildren get together in the mm-hmm. summertime, right? Yep. That was his dream. And the way he would go about doing it is by saving money, buying stock, saving money, buying stock. And he was showing me how he always invested in stock where he knew who they were, like big, big companies, names you all heard of. Mm-hmm. And at the time, it might have been Kodak or you know something like that. And they were paying dividends, right? Dividend paying stock, blue chip companies. That was his approach. And by the way, that was an excellent approach for what he was trying to accomplish. And guess what? Sure enough, when he and my grandmother retired, they had the money to buy the cottage. So they bought the cottage. And it was awesome. And I remember we'd go up as kids up there. And this is northern Michigan, folks. Even in the summer, it gets cold there. I remember that the rule was we, that you know, we could not put our toes in the water until it was 70 <laughs> degrees. Mm-hmm. And they had my grandparents had this big thermometer mm-hmm. on, on the wall by the, uh, by the beach. They had a little beach house. And on that beach house yeah. was a big thermometer. And we would sit there and just watch it, mm-hmm. you know, like watching a clock. You know, 69, oh, we can't go in the water yet. 70, boom, in we'd go. And it was freezing cold water, but we were kids. We didn't care, right? Remember, what was his goal? Get the cottage. Mm -hmm. But what happened when he retired? He got the cottage. Did his goals change? Well, now you got to keep it. Now you got to keep the cottage, right? Because the idea is he wanted to pass this down to his children. This is the family enclave. This is where my grandfather made the mistake. He did not recognize that his goals changed. And so his investing just kept going. He just kept owning these blue chip companies. And his thinking was, this is awesome because I get capital appreciation and the dividends, you know, combined with his pension and Social Security took care of all the bills. But then a funny thing happened. The markets decided that it was time not to cooperate for a while, right? They decided... We're going to actually go south. It was the oil embargo in the early 70s. We're going to go take a trip south to Florida or something for a while, Mm -hmm. right? And it's going to be a while before we come back to hang out with you. So for my grandfather, all of his money was in these stocks. They're all paying dividends that he was counting on to make ends meet. And when the stock went down, the value of his stocks went down, Zach, what do you think happened to the dividends? Oh, they went away. They went, well, they didn't go away, but they definitely went down, right? So next thing you know, he's like, oh, crap, the dividends are enough. I'm short. I don't have enough money to pay the bills. So what did he have to do to pay the bills? Sell the cottage. Well, no, he had to sell stocks. Stocks, yeah. He had these stocks. He sold them. But did he sell them at high prices? Low prices. No, because the market went down. Sold them at low prices. And so this starts like this downward spiral because he's selling low, which means he has to sell more shares to get the money he needs which means those shares are gone, so they're not generating dividends anymore, which means next year he's got to sell even more stock and even more, and it's just it's a downward spiral, right? right. Next thing you know, he's <laughs> running out of money. He's like, oh, boy, now I got to sell the family cottage. I got to mm-hmm. sell the dream. And I'm telling you, selling that cottage broke my grandfather. This bigger-than-life man who was happy and laughing all the time 
once that cottage was sold, when he he got his dream and he lost it, he lived a year and died. And that year that he lived, it's like he shrunk as a person. I never saw him laugh again. It was, it, it broke him. And when he died, there's my grandmother, right? All by herself now. But guess what? What happened to all the money? It was gone. Yeah, money's like gone. Now he's gone, leaving my grandmother with basically what? Nothing. Nothing. Ah, but here we go. My grandfather did something that was really smart. He have some life insurance? He had a big life insurance policy because he always believed in life insurance. He left my grandmother a big life insurance policy. Now, it wasn't big enough to replace all of their retirement savings, but it was big enough that it replaced a big chunk of it. So my grandmother gets this huge tax-free check, huge in the day, right? It was mm -hmm. probably, I don't even remember, I don't know the amount. It's probably a couple hundred thousand or something. But back then, this would have been in the 70s. That would have been a pretty significant number, right? right? So we go from grandmother thinking she's going to be just destitute, and she's obviously freaking out over that to holy cow this check comes in and bam she goes from destitute to back to being financially comfortable like with the snap of your fingers right and i promise you my grandmother was not interested in buying dividend paying blue chip <laughs> company stock after seeing what you know they just went through right so anyway she invests in a more balanced portfolio of mutual funds at the time uh, she go, goes out, get some help, and, and there you go. She's off and running, right? So you think, oh, thank goodness. Everything is good. Life is grand. We are happy campers again. Oh, but then what happens? Grandma starts to uh, get a little older. She starts losing it mentally. In fact, there reached a point where, um, you know how uh, there are people that prey on the elderly? Mm -hmm. So my, this is how we found out that our grandmother was losing it. One day we went up to visit her and my dad was kind of going through, you know, helping her balance. She's like, Hey, I need a little help balancing the checkbook. Mm -hmm. So he starts going through a checkbook and he's like, mom, what's this? What's this? Well, grandma had been sending in, you know, she's been getting these letters of, Hey, you won money. Mm -hmm. You got to send us a check so we can send you the money. And she bought into it hook, line, and sinker. She had been spending like close to um, over $1,000 a month. And again, this was now early 80s. Mm -hmm. Like over $1,000 a month, which is a lot back then, sending various checks to people. And she's like, it's okay. I'm getting this money coming back in. Mm -hmm. It was all scams. All scams. And she couldn't figure that. She just couldn't understand it. Right? And so we got her to a doctor. It turns out, yeah, she's got Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Right? So that starts the time where, well, it's time to start maybe getting someone to watch her, which costs money. Then we got to get her into assisted living, which costs money. Then we got to get her into a nursing home, finally, that costs money. And my grandmother lived with, oh, for like 10 years, with just this Alzheimer's just getting worse and worse and worse. She lived over 10 years until by the time she passed away, she didn't even recognize any of us. It was a blessing when she died because, I mean, that's no quality of life, right? And a lot of you listening, you might know someone who's been in that kind of, you know, that type of situation. It's sad to see. Sometimes I think doctors keep us alive longer than they should. Anyway, by the time, in fact, within, within I'd say, five, six years of this, so, you know, we're getting through the cycle. Again, all the money's gone again. And now... Here she is. She dies basically broke penniless, right? Now think about what happened here with my grandparents. <clears throat> when they retired, they had the equivalent of today's dollars. Now remember, they retired way back, late 60s, you know, and they had an, the, the amount of money they had was easily equal to over a million dollars in today's dollars. And it's not like they were huge spenders. Mm -hmm. They made, Grandfather made a mistake. And not realizing that retirement is a fundamental shift of life, didn't change his investing. As a result, he lost all of it. Thankfully, when he died, he leaves a bunch of life insurance to grandmother. 
not worth a million dollars today, but probably 800000 or something, right? Mm-hmm. But because she ignored the risk of long-term care, of health care, she ended up dying broke and penniless. And do you think that's how they wanted to die? I mean, holy cow. Retire with a million, lose it all. Get most of it back, lose it all. Not what you want in retirement. Nope. That's not a financially secure retirement. And the question that you really have to ask yourself as you're listening, what about you? You know, if you're middle class, upper middle class, you have between 250000 to a, you know, three, four, five million saved in retirement. If you're in that range, you know, if you make mistakes, you could end up just like my grandparents. You don't want that. If you remember, my parents retired in 1999 and they had about 300000 saved for retirement. And the industry told them, just invest in a balanced portfolio. 60% stocks, 40% bonds, a diversified balanced portfolio, which works really, really well when you're saving money and you don't want too much risk. But if you try to take income from that portfolio, it only works when the markets go up. Mm -hmm. If the markets go down, like they did in 2000, 2001, 2002, you can lose half your money, which is exactly what happened to my parents. And it really messed them up. And by the way, the good news is I was able to jump in eventually and help them, but, you know, it messed them up. Right. Or in 2008, when the markets lost half of their value over a year and year and a half period, you're up the creek without a paddle, right? This 60-40 portfolio is horrible for retirement planning if you're retired. It is like the death knell. It gives you a feeling that you're good. And you feel good until the markets decide not to cooperate, and then you are in a world of hurt, mm -hmm. right? You need better planning than that, and there are ways to do it. But this brings up the core hypocrisy of the financial industry. So here you go. So you can go through things like risk profile questionnaires. You can say, hey, I'm getting ready to retire. Let me fill out this risk profile questionnaire. <clears throat> in both cases, they're going to give you portfolios that they recommend that, by the way, are going to look a whole lot like the exact same portfolio my parents had 20-some years ago that have failed twice in, you know, since then. They fail. It's like they'll both tell you to do the same thing. Do they, do they learn that, oh, these portfolios don't work when the markets don't cooperate? Oh, they know it, but eh, who, they don't care, right? But that's not the part that makes me angry. Here's the part that makes me angry. In both cases, when you look at these portfolios— they give you data. They say, you know, since 1926, by the way, they have data all the way back to the 1800s. So mm -hmm. why they started 1926, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a sneaking suspicion. Hmm. I wonder why. <laughs> but anyway, they say since 1926, a portfolio like this has averaged something like an 8% rate of return. And, you know, you have some good years and bad years, but on average, you earn about 8%. And if you take out 4%, that means, hey, you get your income and you're growing your portfolio by 4%, keep pace with inflation. And does that not give you the warm and fuzzy, Zach? Do you like, oh, that feels so good. I'm going to average 8%. And if I only take out like three or four, I'm, I'm going to be inflation protected. This just feels so good. Doesn't that feel good? It would make me feel good, but I think I know where you're going with this. Okay, so here's the deal. Yeah. <laughs> they are out there telling you this stuff on their websites. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it's out there. But here's the thing. They say, here, do what we say so we can make money on you. And we're going to tell you you can expect her an 8% over time. Well, they do say his past performance is no guarantee of future results. So they're covering their backside. But nowhere do they really say, everywhere it says, hey, you're going to earn 8%. I mean, that's what they say. Yeah. On average. Yet. If you Google what they think is going to, what markets are going to return over the next 10 years, what do you think this, this 60, 40 portfolio is going to actually earn over the next 10 years? Zach, do you know what they think a 60, 40, a 60, 40 portfolio is going to earn over the next 10 years? Lower than 8%. Yeah. Like two to 4%. And I'm like, this is the part that really gets like, if you think if you've listened to the show, you know I hate politicians and I hate taxes and I hate those, you know, those weasels, weasels yes. in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and I might have just got, I don't know. Sometimes I get beeped out when I use that word. So I'll say it once again, weasels. 
there. If I got beeped out again there, you know, yeah. basically it's a it's an ugly form of a rodent. Yes. Right. Then I'm calling these so-called people in D.C. It's not all of them, of course, but, yes. you know, come on. They're worse than used car salespeople. <laughs> and guess what? There are some good used car salespeople, so I shouldn't right. even say that. But here's the deal. This is the point I'm trying to get to. They're treating you like dirt. They're treating you with zero respect. They are treating you like dirt. And what makes me mad is you deserve so much better than this. You deserve consistency of expectation here. If they sit there and tell you in their marketing, hey, you should average 8%. But then they turn around and say, but we only think you're going to earn two to four. Mm -hmm. Do we see a problem there? Big problem. I mean, that's if that's not hypocrisy, I don't know what is, right? You deserve to be working with someone that can look you in the eyes and say, look, this is what is reasonable to expect, and this is what you have to make your plans based on. By the way, I believe if you do things right, you should be able to do better than two to 4%, right? You should definitely be able to do better than that. But can you do eight with these balanced portfolios? Pie in the sky. It's complete BS. And it drives me crazy. Don't be listening to that. You deserve better. So here we go. We're at the end of the show. Here's what I'm going to do for you. We're giving you a free second opinion by someone that's been doing this for 25 plus years. I'm going to look over your shoulder. I'm going to help make sure you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's because I believe you know, your middle class, upper middle class person, you are great families. That's what I grew up in. And I believe that you're great families and you deserve the respect of getting proper planning. It's absolutely free to get a double, a second opinion. There's no cost. And it all starts with an easy 15 minute phone call where you share with us, Hey, here's what your, you know, what's on your mind, right? What are you thinking about? Mm -hmm. What are you concerned about? <clears throat> Let's help you get on the right path for retirement or at least double check that you're on the right path. No harm in a double check, right? No harm in that second opinion. Why not make sure you're making all the right choices? It's super easy. It's free. Zach, help us out. What do our listeners need to do? Mike, it's 512-886-5850. Again, give us a call at this number, 512-886-5850. Now, one more time, it's after hours. You're going to get our answering service, and they're just going to get your name, your phone number, and a good time for us to give you a call back one last time, 512-886-5850. Folks, I want to help you enjoy the retirement that you so richly deserve. Let's get this second opinion done so that we can make sure you are on the right track. Okay.